bom dia. Bom dia. Bom dia a São Paulo. Welcome to São Paulo. South America 2018. It is wonderful to be back here with all of you in Sao Paulo for what is, I believe, the 10th Automotive Logistics South America Conference. So celebrating a decade uh, here together and uh, what a decade it has been indeed. Uh, before I go a little bit further, let me just make sure that you're all aware that um, the conference is being translated simultaneously in English and Portuguese. Um, this is Portuguese that I'm speaking right now, for those of you who are not familiar. <laughs> um, they're, they're available in the, in the front. I am aware of the irony of me saying that in English, and if you don't speak English and you don't know that, it's, uh, that they're available, then you probably don't understand me. So here for my, um, my, my comedy act of the day, uh, bear with me. A tradizio simultanea. Good, okay, good. <laughs> so again, most, I think all of the presentations today uh, will be in Portuguese. Uh, I will, myself and our editor, Joan Perry, who will be hosting another session, will, will, will probably be the only ones mainly speaking in English. But you can pose any questions in English, um, and, and obviously there'll be other discussions, so, so please use whatever language you prefer. We'll make sure that, that it's translated. Also, whoops. Uh, also, for those of you who, um, this is a new feature, I believe, for, for this conference, we have a conference app. For those of you who haven't already downloaded it when you registered, because you would have had a link, um, there are some instructions here. Uh, you just have to, you can, you can get it from the, the Apple Store or Google Play, um, look up Ultima Media or Automotive Logistics, and, and, and you'll find it. Um, it. You'll find the program details, speaker details, but you'll also be able to uh, see the delegate lists. You can send messages securely um, if you're open to that, um, to, other, to other delegates. Um, you can also pose questions. There is a, a, a question a section, so you can send a question to the moderator. Uh, and I'll, I'll check it, and I can pose a question to our panel during the discussions. So, so please uh, uh, take some time to download the app uh, if you haven't already. You can also give feedback as well. So it's a good, it's a good thing to, to have and use. Um, those of you not familiar with our format, we will have sessions throughout the morning, um, uh, this, this session running to around probably 10.30, and then we'll have some coffee. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll have a, a lunch, a nice lunch around um, 12, 15, today, uh, coffee breaks in between, plenty of networking opportunities. Um, we're, we're here until around 5.30, and then this evening we are off to a, a fantastic gala dinner. So we've got a lot of information to share, uh, insight to offer, connections to make, uh, and, and of course plenty of networking for you to connect. Um, before I go too much further, I'd like to, to recognize and thank uh, our sponsors once again, without whom this event would, would really not be possible. Uh, our premier sponsor, Penske, very, very happy and proud to, to be working here with Penske again in South America, as we do elsewhere in, uh, in the world, including Mexico and the US. Um, Penske is the host of our, of our gala dinner later. Also our gold sponsor, CFR Rinkins, uh, and, and our global sponsors who, who sponsor numerous of our events around the world, CHEP, Jeffco, and CNW Courier Network. Um, most of the sponsors have stands outside for you to visit, booths to, to get to know them better and uh, learn about some of the services that they offer here, especially and particularly for uh, the Brazilian market and South America region. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we're, we're about uh, a decade here that we've been running this event in, in, in Brazil and uh, in South, well, covering South America and covering it in, in our publication, Automotive Logistics, online and in print. Uh, in fact, those of you who have the app would have, would have gotten a notification. There's a, a report, a special report, which we've just published this week uh, on Brazil, updating um, how the market is developing for automotive logistics and supply chain, sort of kicking off uh, our discussions this week. Um, because in those 10 years, uh, it has certainly been tremendous change, many ups, perhaps as many downs, as I don't have to tell you. Uh, some familiar themes, which if we turn the clock back 10 years, we wouldn't sound too differently, talking about infrastructure bottlenecks, long queues at ports, traffic jams, lack of multimodal infrastructure. 
Back then, we used to talk a lot about logistics blackouts because of growth and, and, and the, the risks that it would have on, on the market. We may, maybe haven't talked that much about that in recent years, but, but uh, perhaps not for the reasons that we would have hoped because of a difficult market. Um, we, we've gone, in some cases, from, from peaks and valleys, from crisis to boom and, and back again. And despite all that change in that 10 years, I'm not sure that we've ever gotten together at, the, at a time of, of, of maybe more significant change, important change, hope and optimism again, and, and then, of course, also uncertainty. Be that in the, in the markets it, themselves, in the technology, the technology of the products, the technology in our business processes, uh, the business models that we're, that we're using, looking at, and changing, uh, and the geopolitical landscape, of, of course. As I mentioned, plenty of it is a basis for optimism, I think. And hence, that's the theme of our conference this year, a new dawn, a new supply chain. Uh, Brazil is finally showing, or has shown, stronger recovery. The auto industry is growing again, expected to grow further. We'll have a lot of statistics to share with you this morning, so I, I won't go into detail on them now. But manufacturers are committing investment again in, into products and plants, and the supply chain is responding. If we look across the region, there's also some hope too. Colombia, Chile, also strong growth. And uh, logistics providers and suppliers have been adjusting their businesses, investing in new technologies, and, and are getting ready to, to benefit from, from this recovery. But there is no, no new dawn without rays of darkness either. And every change brings uncertainty. So I don't think any of you are too young to remember the last peak we're still quite a long ways off of that, whatever that would have been, 2013. So we're still a long way off of the previous highs. And of course, we don't have to travel too far to encounter ongoing crises, whether that's in Argentina or Venezuela. And of course, Brazil is entering a new political order. Um, we won't say too much about that here. As a foreigner, I don't think I have all the, all the right perspectives on it, that's for sure. But it's fair to say that the country has been divided in, in many ways, probably like no time in recent memory. If you're an optimist, you, can, you could look to much needed reform, crackdowns on corruption, simplification of regulation and taxes. And of course, there are other worries too, whether it's about rule of law, civil liberties, democracy, etc. But a new dawn is coming. And uh, we ask ourselves, what's ending with that? I think the auto industry hasn't faced such fundamental questions about its products and business models in probably 100 years, quite frankly. Global vehicle sales continue to grow, and we have emerging markets which, which drive a lot of that growth. But on the other hand, automation, connectivity, alternative energy, changing regulations, all of these are, are, are changing our perspectives. If you just look at the GM announcements this week in, in the US and North America about the plant closures, uh, and more to come globally. I think it shows that the pace of change is, is, is vast, is, is rapid. And if you're not preparing your business for the future, if you're not changing with it, then you'll get left behind quite, quite quickly. Those, obviously, whether that's dealing with trade costs, whether that's dealing with new, investing in new technologies and regulation. It's an interesting and exciting and somehow sometimes worrying time. And I think Brazil is not going to be unaffected by this, South America. This is all very relevant to the discussion we're having here, whether, again, it's the, the look to alternative energy and, and, and uh, technology that we'll be investing in. We'll hear about programs like Ruta 2030, uh, which, are, which are coming into place and which will set, set perhaps something of a new path for, for some of the car makers and, and the industry here. Uh, again, so it's, it, it is, but I think as we'll see, there, it, there is investment. There is a look to the future. I was speaking with Gustavo, Brazilians are, if nothing, if not optimists, and I think that's what's exciting uh, about, about where we are right now. There is a new dawn, and, and we're here together to discuss that and, and look to the changes and look how we can work together. So that's sort of where we stand as we go into this event. We, we've got a great program ahead of you today with a lot of industry experts, insiders, uh, and, and, and um, also from outside the industry as well to, to give some perspectives. The format, for those of you who have not been with us before, we'll have presentations from all of our panelists, and we'll have some time for, for Q&A at the end. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our, our panelists, uh, starting from, from your left, Gustavo Bonini, who's a board member for Anfavia and, and also works uh, for, for Scania. Uh, Eli, uh, Elias Murfarej, advisor for Cinti Peches, who's, uh, of course, an important tier supplier organization, Anfavia, of course, being the Automotive Manufacturers Association. 
uh, Cindy Pesters for the, the, the parts, so we have perspectives from, from the full supply chain there. Marcelo Chiaffi is automotive leader in Brazil for PwC, who will be able to, much better than me, lay out the economic indicators and some of the forecasts and direction that the, the wider region is facing. And we're really pleased to have a special guest speaker uh, joining us, Marcelo Turi, who's the head of supply chain NIT for Alpargatas. Most of you here will know that. Any fun from outside of the country will know perhaps the Havaianas, Havaiana brand a little bit, a little bit better. As obviously a, so a very important uh, and renowned global retailer uh, with a very complex supply chain to manage. Quite different to an automotive supply chain, but a lot of interesting technology, processes, demand planning that, that, uh, that apply across. And we're going to have a, a chance to hear from Marcelo uh, about insights uh, from there about what the automotive industry can learn. So with that, I'd like to now hand over to our panel of experts. And uh, we'll start with Gustavo Bonini from Anfavia. Senhoras e senhores, bom dia. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Very pleased to be here in this event. As Christopher said, um, 10 years, it's part of our calendar in Brazil, is one of the most important events in the logistics segment. They bring to us lots of the base during the day. And it feeds the whole of the automotive uh, chain in Brazil. Uh, very important issues, what about the future? How can we face the challenges that we uh, see? I'm the first one to make a presentation, so I'm going to establish the background. Where are we? Where are uh, the companies here in Brazil? And um, what's the pressure that it brings to supply chain, transport, uh, a little bit of exports, uh, some data about the volumes in the last years and the possible growth for the future, concluding to some questions and I would uh, like uh, uh, to have the questions and I would like to have uh, the solution for the problems. Well, I'm going to start here with this image. So, you have to know where those companies are located. I made another presentation in another association. Those that are outside the automotive area does not see how the logistic chain is covering the whole country, supply chain and OMs. And uh, we have Curitiba, a little bit in Minas, also Bahia, but is already covering the whole of the country. This is not from today, some decades ago. It's growing, is strengthening in power, but this is extremely important because it brings development for the country. We have the um, chain of suppliers, and we're going to see the quantity of uh, employees that we have here in the whole uh, chain, including your NEMS and supply chain, bringing uh, technology to the country and um, greater knowledge. But for logistics, which is our theme today, brings lots of complexity and lots of pressure. How to bring all the parts and components to the plants and then how to export all that or how to transfer that from the southern part of the country to the northern part of the country. You know, Brazil has continental dimensions, great deficiency in infrastructure all around, highly concentrated. We have to look at this image, checking on um, the positioning of um, O&Ms and uh, plants we have to think differently in the multimodal. How can we do that? How can we connect all the solutions in transport? And you, as we have logistics operators, how to be part of the debate, 
to find a new chain for the future as the volume we have. With the vol volume that we have today, we are surviving. But we are really optimistic, as I told Christopher. For the next year, we want to grow. We want to constantly grow. And for that, we have to have solutions. We cannot expect that uh, logistics become a bottleneck. Some numbers. Billings, almost $60 billion in the whole of the industry. GDP, the participation that we have for 2015, representing 21%. One fifth of the productive uh, GDP of the country, so it's highly significant. Uh, of the trade balance, 20 billion in, in exports, 19 in imports, plus or minus. We have a balance here. It could be um, higher, lower, uh, but what is important here is not the debate. It's better to export and import. Uh, we want both of them to grow. The country must grow in exports and in imports, not only in automotive business, but in all sectors. Eighth world market, ninth world producer. We went down because we were number four. Now we are number nine. There was a growth in other markets as too. Employment, 1.3 million of people without employment is really significant. 64 plants, 10 states, 42 municipalities, an installed capacity of 5 million and 109,000 agricultural and uh, road uh, machines. And uh, 26 OAMs, 582 uh, plants for parts and concessionaires, 5,000. So, the internal market, 2012, 3.8, 3.77, very good numbers, very positive, and suddenly we have a not of four. We went down, it was quite significant. We're speaking about a potential of um, install uh, systems that are higher than that. Now we have uh, some growth comparing 17 with 18. Significant growth, heavy trucks 50% comparison between 2017 with 2018, but it's less than the install capacity. So it's good news, it's growing, it's growing. We're happy with that. If we continue, with our forecast, it seems that we have a, a bias towards growth for next year. This is interesting because it seems that we're going forward here in terms of prosperity, exports, ups and downs, 2017 high. It's a record for the last years, which is highly positive for us. We use the auto capacity to export. So going into logistics, we need more logistics. We have to participate in exports as well. And here we see a drop due to the Argentinian market. In terms of logistics, several NMs could increase their exports. Why? Because they were participating in other markets as well. Argentina is significant, is one of the, um, the great markets in South America, our neighbor. But we have to think about all the possibilities. We cannot get dependent on just one country. It's a crisis. As any other, this is going to disappear. But we have the possibility of uh, check the uh, infrastructure imports, exports within uh, South America, and perhaps also to all the areas. Uh, the production here is 2.7. This is the last numbers that we have here in production. The expectation is 3 million for this year. Let's see if this is confirmed. Um, Argentina is pulling us down, but you know, next year is around the corner. Now, the participation of imported goods. The point 
is not is good or is it bad? It's good that we're growing also in exports. If it means importing too, it's not a problem. Here, another image showing the growth of um, imports and exports, and what we call the um, trade flow. This motivates the whole of the market, motivates the production here in the country. And those are agricultural and uh, road paving machines. We have here growth in the internal market, a little bit of drop in exports, and the sales in terms of imported goods, uh, at the lower level. And then we come to this image. This is the situation. We had a recent drop. And now we're facing a possibility of growth. How can we prepare for that? Thinking as a whole and thinking about the industry and having a bias from the point of view of logistics, we have to go through two points from the wall inside. What do we have to do inside our houses, O&M, uh, um, auto parts and all that, and from the wall outside. So inside, we have here a question, how to supply to the plants and distribute the final product in a more efficient and less costly way. We have to have modern productive processes, investments in engineering and P&D, and uh, quality products. As it was mentioned here in the opening, we have the route uh, 2030, so how can we deal with that? So is investments in engineering and uh, research and development, which is the base of our program. The base of the program is the stimulus and the investment in research and development to bring visibility for consumers and for the government itself that will have the possibility of having a, a program for 15 years ahead roadmap for security, roadmap for the, the energy area. This is quite tied to logistics, so is the problem of mobility route 2030. With the new demands and uh, with the new delineation, the industry may prepare itself in terms of logistics, new suppliers perhaps, or suppliers there are already in existence but will create uh, new plants because uh, new parts will be required. And this is connected 100% with Renova Bill. You have to deal with the new fuels, alternative fuels. The country is open to that and is very good supply for that. We have the hybrid cars, we have a potential ethanol in um, biomethane, um, biogas, and this is going to require more technology, new plants, and also an effort in terms of logistics. So uh, that's why we started with the, the map showing where the O&Ms are. And the new suppliers, they are distributed all around the country uh, and now connected to agribusiness where we have much demand and biodiesel could be produced by the agribusiness too. And from the wall outside, the question is more connected to exports. With the drop in Argentina, perhaps a greater visibility. With investments that were carried out in the products that we have at um, global level quality, we can export the, all the other capacity that we have outside, how to increase the exports facing such an adverse reality. Logistic cost is high, much more than in other countries. This is a reality, low quality in transportation infrastructure and lack of integration of the models for transportation. So, you know, all the manufacturing uh, plants are distributed throughout the country, but we cannot say, well, infrastructure is a problem. We have to think about the solution for that. 
we have to have a better infrastructure and we have to fight for that. All of us that are here have creativity and we have to find solutions. While we do not have the proper infrastructure, what can we do? Creating a pilot of my multimodal system, reverse logistics perhaps, and uh, suppliers and logistic operators, optimization of their chains. So we have to make do while the new infrastructure is coming. And with that, we have less competitiveness. And here, just speaking about infrastructure, we have um, the bottlenecks at the ports, uh, the increase of operational costs, and um, we have here other problems as well. In the production of grains, for instance, we do not have um, uh, the silos that we would be requiring. At that moment, we have in some uh, ports in Santos, here in the Sao Paulo, we had you know, such a bottleneck that it was impossible. We had just a roadway for agribusiness, for industrial products, all together. So if we have a major growth and fast growth for the next years, as a hypothesis, we do not have proper infrastructure. We have to have new programs for us to look forward 15 years ahead. The growth has to be continuous at a pace that everybody will be capable of uh, adjusting themselves to. So we have to de deal with the effects, which is the bottlenecks, uh, the increase in operational costs, the increase of the Brazilian costs, and so on and so forth. But we, together, we have to find a solution. We have to create a coalition of those that participate in the logistic segment for automotive business in the country. So growing the volumes, we hope that we can export more and uh, profit from the idle capacity of plants in Brazil. Thank you very much for your time. And I launch here this provocation, this challenge. Obrigado, Gustavo. I think uh, of uh, getting a sense of the complexity of, of, of the network here. Uh, looking ahead, uh, as, as Gustavo made the point, uh, we could very well be talking about those logistics blackouts again. Um, is there a plan in place to look 15, 20 years ahead? Uh, this is the, the perspective that, that we need. So um, I think that, that set us off on a good footing from the point of view of what OEMs are, are looking for in the future from a logistics network point of view. Um, now we'll, we'll, we'll look towards more into the supply chain from a perspective from tier suppliers with um, Elias uh, Mufarej from City Patches. Thank you. Thank you. Bom dia a todos. Primeiramente, eu quero agradecer a organização. First, I would like to thank you, the, the organizers uh, for the invitation to make the presentation by Sindipas in such an important summit. And at the same time, thank the organization for the honor uh, given to our entity. Sindipas, so, for those who don't know us, is the entity that gathers about 450 members and is uh, spread all over the country. As Gustavo said, actually, we have uh, accompanied the development of the automotive industry because we are the suppliers and we are here to serve the automotive industry in the replacement market as well as exports. It's the Union of Trade Parts Manufacturers. So here you have a brief sample of our current status. We uh, 
So here you can see the development of uh, sales, both in reals as well as in dollars. And it shows a very good development starting in 2017. And the forecast of recovery when compared to the years that we have a negative GDP. So we forecast for this year a revenue of 98.8 billion reais and 27 billion dollars. And the forecast for 2019 amounts to more than 100 billion reais and 28.3 billion dollars. This shows an important evolution, but actually it still suffers the effects of the negative GDP years. As you see in the production figures uh, shown by Gustavo in the automotive industry, that uh, shows already the reflects the reflections the negative impacts of those negative gdp years the sales of the industry has recovered but there's still room for further recovery especially in terms of production capacity here this line shows clearly the job positions, the how it has developed, number of people working in this industry. So now, in 2018, we are getting back to the levels of 2015, which was not an ideal level. But for 2019, we forecast a growth of 185,000 new jobs. And trade balance, which is important because it exports of auto parts and imports, we will still have to coexist uh, with a deficit because the needs of the industry today is looking at new products with new technologies. So in years to come, we'll still have heavy imports when compared to what we export. In the point of view of the government, this is a, an evolution or a development that will happen in throughout the future years, considering that we'll have more investments here in the auto parts industry to introduce new technologies, new auto parts that will be part of the Brazilian market in the next 10 years. This is a table that shows revenues by segment. The assemblers or OEMs and we show the drop in sales in reais and how it is evolved. And we forecast uh, attaining a figure in reais amount similar to 2013. 2013 was a very good year. So this development will determine that in 2019, we'll have a growth when compared to 2018 of almost 10%. This is another important market linked to logistics, the aftermarket, because it serves 40 million vehicles, 43 million vehicles that are in our fleet. The aftermarket has supported the entire industry during the crisis period because its share in the sales became more important. It, its share was 18 percent, uh, for 15 percent in 2018, 
and it didn't suffer negative consequences because it has improved. This is a, a variation due to tax issues, but actually it has been growing since 2013 and a significant growth rate. For this year, we expect a growth uh, also a high growth and a sales of almost 17 million reais. We forecast a growth of 7.8% for 2019. Exports are exports made exclusively by this auto parts industry. And we also forecast a growth. As Gustavo mentioned, we expect the crisis of Argentina to settle. Argentina is our larger, largest imports, both in vehicles and auto parts. So this market, along with the development and the effort that Cindy Pesas is doing in its programs, such as Brazil Auto Parts in collaboration with Apex, we have encouraged exports especially to Latin America. This is the intra-sector part. It's important because there is an exchange between multinational companies present here. So companies export to each other. And this is important because it brings up-to-date products from abroad, and these products are also exported to other multinational companies that are installed in Brazil. So this is a table that shows uh, an optimistic view for the future years, especially for 2019. We forecast a growth of 8.4% on sales of the four segments. And what's most important is to be able to state that the crisis is over. And we have gone through the crisis and managed it uh, well. It was a very strong crisis, but our expectation for the future is moderate. It is reflected here in this slide showing the production capacity of this industry. As you may see, we have 70% uh, of our production capacity being used. And in order for us to have a real situation of settled in the more comfortable for the industry, we'll have to be using 85% of installed capacity in order to reach a level in which we could say that we have uh, really overcome the crisis and the situation is more comfortable. So there's still some room to, to grow in that, in terms of production capacity and reducing idle capacity. This is a chart that shows the main market for Sinji Passes, which is our OEM companies. And this is the closing figures for 2018 forecast, and we reached almost 3 million. It's important to remind you that in 2013, we expected to have 4.5 million vehicles. And today, we're quite lower than that, but growing. Of course, the basis has gone through significant decreases since 2013. And we may say that a forecast for 2019 is estimated at 4%, which is a moderate evolution. And this growth is accompanied 
by figures for 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. So 2021 20, and 22. So we would reach 3.5 million vehicles in 2022. This scenario can change down or up. Uh, it will depend on the status and the way in which the automotive industry requirements are met. And that depends on government policies. And we'll show the influence of those policies, especially the Route 2030 project. and how it could help the production basis for the automotive industry. This is a short presentation about the steps towards the competitive integration. So the active participation of Brazilian suppliers in trade fairs in order to open and develop markets in our aftermarkets, OEM, and first-year system suppliers. This is one of the goals of Sindipesas for coming years. This is mm, bringing closer domestic suppliers and foreign suppliers with the purpose of creating partnerships in technology, marketing, and new businesses. This is an important topic because it addresses investments. So this matchmaking would allow us to bring new investment to Brazil, adding new technologies to our market. And Sindipesas is working heavily on that, especially in co cooperation with uh, PEPS. And also a more clear exposure of our members to new manufacturing processes, because these uh, technologies will be decisive for coming years, especially for the 4.0 industry. We always try to make this investment to show our members, especially to small and medium-sized companies, so that they get to learn about the new technologies and update themselves. And also, the fourth item would be technology and disruptive trends tracking, especially regarding uh, autonomous vehicles and the new trends in the automotive markets, right? Automo autonomous vehicles, car sharing, in which a car is used by a group of people, and electrification. All of these uh, are topics addressed by Sinji Passes, and we have a program to make our members informed about the development of these new trends and also keeping uh, direct contact with the OEM companies that are our customers. Now, some facts about the Route 2030. In the medium and long term, our vision is the following. First, this regime has a very clear regulation on emissions, energy efficiency, connectivity, trying to cause the vehicles sold in Brazil to have the same technology and when compared to vehicles sold abroad. A direction towards the development of a supply chain. This is very important for the industry and is 
it is within the scope of our work for the coming years. Also, a direct incentive to research and development for vehicles and auto parts producers. Also, an important item is the program would require a technical inspection of vehicles because there is a need to learn about the current status of our fleet. This is something the government should undertake and consequently a fleet renewal program that would be closely related to logistics because there is a large fleet of vehicles, especially trucks, that are very old and that uh, run a serious uh, risk in terms of uh, safety as well as efficiency. That has a, poses a heavy burden on freight costs. You that work in logistics know very well that we have a very inefficient freight due to the quality of the fleet of trucks in operation. Then just to close, we talk about the new rules and obligations regarding emission safety, energy efficiency and connectivity. We say that the Route 2030 will help in investments in research and development and also there is an incentive to autonomous electric and hybrid vehicles and there will also be some government regulation regarding auto parts that are not produced in Brazil and that will probably be included in new models. Thank you very much for your time and attention and for the invitation. Have a good morning or a good day. Thank you very much, Elias. Again, uh, I, I think a very insightful overview of what's happening in the broader supply chain and uh, some of the maybe mega trends mentioned at the beginning, um, which, which we talked about on a global scale around electrification, autonomy, connectivity. This is, as, as, you, as you've heard, very relevant, uh, directly relevant to the future of the industry here in Brazil and the supply chain. As Elias said, the crisis is over, but, but now is the time to look to the future. And I think the focus on, on these investments in, in the right place is really critical. And this will have a big impact for logistics as well, certainly. Um, to give us, uh, so I think, a broader macroeconomic view and forecasting uh, and, and really some great insight, I'm very glad to, to now invite Marcelo Tioffi from PwC. Bom dia a todos. Bom dia. Good morning, everyone. I will break my presentation in two parts. First, I'll talk about projections. I'll try to be quite brief in the projections because we have already talked about them. The second time is the future of the automotive industry, which is uh, the most important part to discuss nowadays because I believe that the automotive industry will go through a very large transformation and it's important to discuss what would be the future of the automotive industry in 2030. It has nothing to do with the 2030 route. It's a global study that shows how the automotive industry will look like in the future. So we cannot talk about automotive industry without thinking about what's going on globally. So when we look at 2017, the automotive world has produced 98 million units, 2018, 96 million. For our forecast for light commercial vehicles and automobiles is to have a growth of accumulated growth of 3% a year. So the global automotive market will continue to grow and evolve, but in a way that's not equal. There is a mismatch between regions. 
And from this growth that we forecast of 96 million units in 2018 until 112 units in 2024, the emerging markets will contribute with 85% of this growth. When you look at the regions, emerging markets that will have such an important contribution, that's the developing Asian countries. Gustavo said that Brazil is the eighth largest market and the ninth producer. Lula posed this challenge for the Brazil, Brazil to produce 5 million. What back then we were discussing that we were the fourth largest market world and eighth largest producer. So there is a problem here. We have to be the fourth largest market and the fourth largest producer. So let's implement a productivity broad because we're being invaded by imports and we wanted to foster local development. Unfortunately, the crisis came, investments were made, but the truth is that I've been making this presentation for many years, and when I talked about this panel, the slide, I said Brazil is here, the BRICS were going to grow, Russia and Brazil just disappeared from the map. Unfortunately, when you look at the top 10 markets worldwide, this growth of 19 million units, the largest will the largest will contribute with 15 million units will be China and India. So Brazil will recover and will contribute a bit more to production, but there are countries such as Thailand, Iran, that start to show up in the map. As for groups of global producers, we'll see that all of them will grow and evolve until then, but new players start to show up. So the contribution to this growth will come from other non-traditional global players. And one of the largest we see here is Gili from China. The gov Chinese government has a, a plan to have global producers competing globally soon. And this is a plan that has been implemented more than 20 years ago, and it's now starting to show. We cannot talk about the automotive industry without thinking about electrification. The, regul the recent uh, regulations about energy efficiency and pollution uh, emissions um, forces companies to go to electrification in many ways. So we see projections here that only less than 5% of the global production in 2017 was in electrics. But at the end of our projection window in 2024, that would account for 21% of a global production. So it will be a four-fold increase in the e electrificated vehicles, all kinds of electric vehicles included. It's important for Brazil to think about that because the automotive industry is more and more global, and this is an important technology. The slides will be available for you later. You can get the details later. Looking at Brazil, as you know, South America is Brazil and Argentina. Argentina was discussed already. They are in recent uh, entered a new recession will continue to produce because of the Brazilian market. They're, they're very closely integrated. Brazil is really finishing its crisis. We believe the things will start to improve as of now. What explains the sale of vehicles is, in Brazil is uh, interest rate, financing terms, and confidence of consumers and uh, massive salaries. It has to do with employment rates. So if interest rates slow down and people have credits because the debt of families reducing and people become more confident and the market g goes back and this confidence is resuming now. I believe that Brazil is one of the hardest countries to compete locally because we have the largest number of brands producing locally and fighting for the same market. It's amazing. In 1990, it used to produce 1.5 million vehicles or with seven producers. Today, we have 14 producers and we'll reach, or in 2012 we had 14 producers, and we'll reach 2024 with 21 co companies. So 21 producers producing locally, fighting for a market that was supposed to have uh, more units, but we haven't got, we didn't get there. 
So in 2012, with the Innovar Auto, in the beginning, we saw a peak in 2013 because Innovar Auto invested a lot in capacity in training, but the market disappeared, and uh, the now the comp the companies are working with idle capacity as well as auto parts industry. When we look at the South America as a whole, we see that between 2018 and 24, production will continue to grow at about 3% a year, which is in line with Singapore has presented. Uh, we see a recovery, but unfortunately, it's not the recovery we would like to see going back to the levels of 2013. So what is the message here? The message is the production in Latin America is uh, recovering, especially in Brazil. There's a strong recovery period will start, but still below what we need. The utilization capacity will still below what we need, at least for the forecast, which is uh, puts pressure on the profitability of uh, car makers as well as in terms of cost. If we have to make a further step towards the future, we have to have money to invest. And we are now discussing this recovery period, still recovery, and we're still fighting to recover investments that have been made in the past. So as he said, we're optimistic towards the future, growing, but still worried because of the idle capacity. This is a concern, competitiveness, the opening the market. Now the market will become more open to new imports. So we have to become more and more competitive as Enfavia is looking for that. This is a chart that we always keep track of and Gustavo has shown as well. Um, it looks like an uh, EEG, so imports proportion in the domestic market and exports on production. It's very volatile, depends on the exchange rate and of the economic moment. And Innovar Auto was created in 2012 when the chart back in 2004-05, only 5% of the domestic market were imported cars. And in 2011, we reached almost 23% of imported cars. It almost doubled, showed that we had little competitiveness in Brazil. We have to be competitive to export, but more than that, to sell in Brazil. So Innovar Out was created by the government to try to uh, hold back on that. And now we are in a new phase. And we believe, we hope that this will be beneficial to Brazil. And the most important part of our message is here now. We made a study thinking about what are the five trends that have an impact on the global automotive market. And in China, Europe, United States, we made a research a survey with consumers assessing emerging technologies and mega trends. So changing the demo demographics of these countries, weather or climate change, advanced technological development. We mapped the different types of consumers that exist in those markets and their behavior as consumers. We have identified three types of consumers in this market. And everything that I say applies to Brazil. The modern consumer, the traditional consumer, the once a car, and the transitory one that could try either uh, technology, depending on the moment. So we're looking at the platforms that are emerging. So we're talking about autonomous vehicles or autonomous shared vehicles, autonomous private vehicles, personally driven shared vehicles, and personally driven private vehicles. So these are the four mobility forms we have. And we have plotted a model to try to understand how the sale of these vehicles will be in the future. And before doing that, the econometric uh, model to check on what is going to be the future. So based on the mega trends, the behavior of the consumer and the new technologies, the emerging vehicle for 2030 will be electric, autonomous, 
shared, connected, connected uh, vehicle consumer, vehicle road, and uh, updated every year in terms of software and hardware because uh, the needs for updating will be more continuous. So based on that, what have we came to con the conclusion of? We shall continue to manufacture volumes similar to today's volumes. Seems a counter sense, but if you're going to share, how are you going to produce more? But putting in the model, you see something different. The fleet is going to be reduced, but the use of the fleet is going to be higher. And uh, the vehicles will have to be renewed constantly. And then there is going to have a great impact in the supply and in the logistic chains. So you have to change vehicles faster. So our habits and mobility will change, mainly in terms of the new generations. New habits will come. We'll have to have models for um, transportation. You know, we have now new electric devices. And you start to see that um, it's a solution of mobility, not really a car that people will wish for. We're going to increase our use of transportation in the future, new mobilities, people that do not drive or cannot drive. And they will have access to a more practical way of being mobile. What's the impact of that in cities? The dream of going outside uh, the city to Alphaville, for instance, is going to be changed because uh, people went out of the city and then they say, this is not possible. So they return to the downtown area. Now possibly going to be able to live out of the core of the city due to the new technologies. So the cars are going to be used more intensively, 24 hours a day perhaps, nonstop. What does it mean in terms of durability of the vehicle and the stock of the fleet will decrease? And the sales of vehicles are going to be higher because you're going to have constant change of uh, hardware and software. The needs of the consumers when they're using the shared vehicles, the autonomous vehicles, this is going to evolve very fast. You're going to uh, have meetings to work and uh, to use more your cars everywhere. It's like an evolution of the smartphones nowadays. We believe that the combination of autonomous and electric vehicles go hand in hand due to uh, fuel to be used type of vehicle, urban mobility. And we have to have a redistribution in terms of uh, research and development partnership with startups, uh, new suppliers, new players, changes in the logistic chain is going to be enormous. Uh, well, we can have uh, reverse uh, logistics in batteries. How are you going to collect the used batteries and re renew them? So uh, reverse logistics is going to be extremely important for the future, a new business for logistics. The decisions in infrastructure of the city, 2020 to 25, each country, each city will have to understand what they want to be for the future and think about the infrastructure and also the change in the business, in the model of the business. The O&Ms are going to operate services. You see O&Ms. Uh, investing in business for sharing vehicles in uh, the skids, electrified uh, uh, individual scooters. And um, it's not clear who's going to operate all that or explore it, but 
automobile as one short thing is going to be changed totally. It's going to be more a uh, service to be uh, presented to the public. And the consumer is going to be changed totally. The cons new consumer is going to consume by time, by kilometers, and and perhaps it's not a direct, direct sales to consumers. Perhaps it's uh, a sales to an organization or a group of people and so on and so forth. This is the message I would like to bring to you. The future is very promising. There are many, many things quite interesting for the future. And this is already happening. Should it come to Brazil, people ask me. Of course it will. There is no doubt in that. The difficulty is to go through the transition period. For O&Ms outside the country, it is difficult to think about the, the changing of the total business model and continue to produce, continue to work at my plants, employing people. It's a major issue, but this is my message. What I want to tell you, the automotive logistics is going to change a lot with the new autonomous vehicles all around and the share vehicles, perhaps we're going to debate. Uh, not only automotive logistics, b but uh, logistics in the automobile. Uh, what can you say in terms of uh, sending alpargatas to different stores in different streets? Uh, shouldn't we have uh, independent vehicles to do this distribution of uh, goods? So new ideas will come around. So this is my message. And the presentation is going to be open for you if you want to pick it up. Thank you very much, Automotive Logistics. Thank you. Mm because we have we have some open uh, seats in the front obviously have a quite a full room um because uh, we have a great session here and uh, obviously students usually don't like to sit in the front right students like to sit in the back you know in case teacher calls on them but we'll let we'll let them pile here but I, again i think we you you've got a great perspective there on again the macro changes that we're seeing in the industry um which which as we say this is this is this is this is very relevant to brazil we have some plenty of seats right here if you want to come through um, and as I think Marcelo made the excellent point there, this, this will have direct implications for, for logistics as well, whether it's the physical supply chain changing, whether it's validating software, whether it's cybersecurity, or indeed new distribution models altogether uh, when we, use, uh, uh, we get into artificial intelligence and autonomy. So now you've, you've heard a lot from different perspectives of the auto industry. Uh, and, and again, I think just to, to clarify again, you will get the slides. Sorry, just Marcelo made the point. <clears throat> it's an important one. We'll, we'll send you a link uh, so you can, you can view slides after the conference so um, you can look at all the details of the statistics then. Anyway, now you, you've gotten a, a perspective on, on the automotive industry. You've got a sense of how the supply chain may be changing, where logistics are going. I think it's really important and, and, and significant now that we can get a perspective from outside of the auto industry. Uh, we may not be going to an era of autonomous flip-flops. However, um, the, the, the technology and advanced analytics, big data, demand sensing, all of these tools which are coming into the supply chain, which other industries like fashion, uh, fast-moving consumer goods, e-commerce, are looking at, I think, have a lot of interesting implications for, for automotive as well. So it's really fantastic, and I'm very pleased to welcome Marcelo Turi, um, for Head of Supply Chain and IT for Alpargatas. Thank you. Abrigado. Bom, é, <coughs> bom dia. Primeiro, obrigado, Christopher, pelo convite. Para mim é um prazer estar aqui com vocês principalmente numa indústria na qual eu normalmente busco exemplos para poder aplicar. Search for products. The automobile industry is at the forefront of the changes. It's a pleasure for me to be here, but I will be speaking about another industry. And if possible, to speak to you about the complexity of what we we are facing. Perhaps we're going to have some insights to share with you. 
Many of you also work for Apogartas or have already worked for it. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm going to be very fast. Apagartas is a 100 years old company, the third company to open uh, capital in Brazil to do uh, an IPO. Alpargatas uh, has uh, is listed at the stock exchange for a long, long time. So a company was basically industrial and is becoming a brand company, in uniting industry with um, different types of supplies, with retail. Uh, Apagatas is the most important brand. It's a very interesting case. But we have Auckland too, as one of our brands. So this luxury uh, fashion, we have a license for Mizuno. We have a long time standing agreement. We are the only ones that developed new products for Mizuno out of uh, Japan. And Topper from Argentina is an Argentinian brand that came into the country. <coughs> is very important too, as a brand. We are present in 112 countries, and we cover 155,000 points of sales, as well as uh, monobrand stores. We have operations in Argentina, United States, and Europe, and 20,000 employees in 2017. This is important because our sector is uh, labor intensive. If you go to Apagatas for a visit, uh, you will be astounded. Even if you are from the same sector. So we hear our market is uh, most specifically a Brazilian one, 65 percent, very good uh, presence in Argentina, and our sandals are all over the world. This is our global footprint. We were a highly industrial company. We have seven brands in Argentina and 10 in Brazil, and we are advancing in all those markets that are part of the retail chain. So we have our own stores here in the Americas, in Europe, in India, China, we have uh, our own stores over there, too, and we're very proud about that. Here you see our line of products. Let me speak about Havaianas. Of course, our focus are the flip-flops, the sandals, but also footwear, accessories, and apparel, or apparel. Alpagatas Navayanas. Everybody think it's a larger company than it is in reality because it's present all over. But it's not really a global company. This is not so. We want to become one. We are a Brazilian exporting company. So we do not have the global vision and this is what we are pursuing now. On, our, on the other side, People tend to believe that this is too simple, flip-flops. Well, we have two parts, two parts in my product. And automotive uh, industry is totally different, thousands of parts. But even so, it's a complex product. And I'm going to speak to you about that within the strategy. When you uh, check on our case story. We had one model, five colors, and that was all we had. The traditional Havaianas was uh, white, and the turnover of the company came with uh, entering the fashion world. This created a proliferation of SKUs, so it brought a high complexity in the uh, uh, 
supply chain. It's very glamorous, but you have to work. The strategy is a winner, but we have to do much to keep it up. How is it that I can forecast which uh, type of uh, Avayana is going to be better? This color, this color, this pattern, the other pattern. So the complexity uh, in our management comes from forecasting. Forecasting properly. I would like to share with you some insights. So, this very simple sandal made of two parts. We have 4.5 billion pairs sold since 1962. 275 million pairs in 2017. And we produce 11 pairs per second. Installed capacity of 350 million pairs. The capacity in Brazil Except for piracy, you know, because uh, we are much copy all around the, the world. It's produced only in Brazil, but copy all around the country. Many Brazil makes the whole difference in our product. We cannot be a Vianas made in China. Not possible. Or any other emerging market. So the installed capacity is totally in Brazil, in our plants at the northeastern portion of the country, 450 models and colors, 5,500 SKUs in sandals. SKU is a model with a color with a size. And those 450 models, colors, and 5,500 SKUs are renewed every year because it's fashion. The models do not change, just a little bit, just a little bit. Different models are appearing, but all the colors are renewed. So it's a product that is perishable, you know? It's a fashion thing, well known as top of mind in the country and outside the country. Here's a comparison. VF Group is an American company that has several brands that are very prestigious all around the world. Timberland, North Face, Hanglers. And they define themselves as experts at managing large scale complexity. So our numbers are quite close to what they have here in terms of production what we do per year, per day, per hour, per minute, per second. It's quite close. Here is wrong. I have 15 minutes. At the end of the presentation, we're going to have 10 new, 10,000 new pairs of Ayana already produced. And what about the supply chain? How to deal with this strategy, which is a winner strategy that we have? We have here uh, the WMAP is uh, an error in forecast. This is a map with errors in forecast from 0 to 100%. So the more basic uh, productions, errors is 10 to 20%, and s suddenly you have an explosion of errors. Why? Due to the issue of the color and the printing. What is going to please uh, the uh, population? It's very difficult to know. So clearly we have t uh, three uh, strips here. We have 12 models, 7% in volume. The W map that you have there. I thought that I was going to uh, sell 10, 100, and uh, I sell 110, and this is uh, an error, and same thing below. So the error is quite huge, so it's uh, predictable. And then we have another group that is unforecastable, and then a, a strip with more than 20% uh, errors. And 
this is a copy of what you do in the automotive area. For the first tree, which is the foreseeable one, in terms of errors, we have within our plants and with our suppliers, we have two supply chains that are totally separated. If not, we would die in terms of, of um, great efficiency. So we have basic products that are very uh, forecastable. So we have consistency and flex with that we do not have any flexibility. If you sell more, we cannot supply it to the customer. We cannot have flexibility for basic products. No way. If not, we're going to be losers. It's totally different from the other chain where we have to invest more in flexibility. The products here have a greater margin and allows you to have a supply chain which is totally different. And here we decrease capacity to decision and cost. So this is our mindset. This is copied from the automotive industry that you know so well. The lean manufacturing and all that. However, we want to go forward. It's not sufficient for us to have those two types of supply chain. It helps us, okay, but even so, we have different collections due to fashion. At the end of the year, even with all those uh, strategies that we use, flexibility in one, not flexibility in the other, so at the end of production, we have out of line. We have to have the outlets, you know, because we are in the fashion business and things get out of fashion. So to deal with that, we started the machine learning or advanced analytics. And we were able to put in a major database 63 variables in a diagram of casual loop. And we have 86 links mapped. All, all the variables are mapped in their links. Based on that, we created a pilot for one of the collections. There were a series of algorithms here, and there were two that responded better to our model. So, Machine learning does not anything all alone. There are much analysis. But two models adapted it themselves to other men. And we come to some conclusions that are relatively obvious. The historic of our stock. If you have a product that is going to be born and is going to be uh, put aside in the same year, uh, we have to take into consideration the situation, seasonality. We are in industrial industry with retail. We have several channels. And we see that the seasonality is different according to the different channels. So we taking that into consideration as well. We have four different levels of behaviors. When we launch those uh, thousands of colors and uh, stamps, you know, uh, you immediately perceive what is going to be agreeable to the user or not. So many of the products will be killed as soon as they are produced. So here we have the product. We have uh, the stamping and you have uh, the colors. Uh -huh. We make um, degrading of, uh, uh, of the colors, and we work with the Pantone color set. And we're going to study the colors for the year, and uh, we try to please the user. 
and uh, the availability of the product in our points of sales. This is fantastic, S and this is very important. I have a great difficulty to distribute my products all around Brazil and all around the world, uh, all the um, production that we have. And in closing, the accumulated line, if you look at the collection, fashion collection, this is traditional era. With the pilot planning, we were able to decrease that for us significantly. The error will remain, but at least it decreased. For us, it means that we are using our assets better, uh, less loss in sales, less uh, uh, capital invested. M my life here is uh, loss of sales and invested capital and this is what I had to bring to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcelo. Presentation, I think a great insight into how, um, ooh, again, a company perhaps with fewer, <laughs> maybe it doesn't have the complexity of part numbers in a, in a given product, but the complexity of the market, the fast pace of the market, the change, the unpredictability of it. <laughs> And, and getting insight into how Albagatas is using, using data to, to reduce that, using machine learning and, and these advanced techniques. Um, I, I think this is, this is you know, not unfamiliar to the same journey uh, and some of the things that are happening in the auto industry as well. So um, a great insight and, and, and interesting, interesting uh, for us to kind of share that. I know we're running over with time, but uh, again, this is great. It's a great panel here, so we don't want to deprive you of the opportunity to, to ask some questions as well. We will uh, we can ex we'll extend the coffee break a little bit to give you some time after, um, but, but we, we do have microphones now. Uh, the room is a little bit tight, so we might have to jump over some tables to get to you, but we'll, we'll make sure that, um, that we get the mic to you. So if anybody has any questions uh, at this time, can I just put your hand up and we'll, we'll get a mic to you. You just say your name and company. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to, to kick off there, um, sort of going back to the first three presentations on the auto industry and coming out of the crisis uh, and looking to the future now. How fundamentally different is the industry and supply chain in, in Brazil today compared to before the crisis? I mean, we've looked a lot about what's happening in terms of future investment around new technologies, processes, but are we, uh, has the industry changed? Is, is, it, is it in a different place than it was, um, you know, from, a, from particularly from a supply chain point of view, if I can start, start with you, Gustavo. I believe so. Perhaps due to an issue of connectivity of the services that we have at uh, our disposal in new technologies. I'm speaking about the supply chain. The integration in between the O&Ms and the suppliers, and uh, even uh, the data portion, uh, you work with your demand and having a confirmation of uh, receiving a difference in what is going to be supplied to you, and this has to be connected with the, the logistic operators. In the last years, not only due to the crisis, but also due to development, in technology debates with the operators and with the supply chain as a whole. This is evolving. The last five years or 10 years, this integration is becoming stronger. The answer that we have to give to the fluctuations in the levels of demand are being uh, dealt with. From here onwards with our growth, I believe that this is going to be more integrated as well. Connectivity comes from the products too. When we have, we speak about heavy trucks, uh, you know, the maintenance is already built in there. Everybody knows what they're going to have to do in terms of maintenance. They have to go there and change the filter in a heavy track at such a specific time. So services to be offered are well planned be 
before. I have a comment which is very interesting. The sales of uh, light cars, automobiles in this recovery of the market has a great participation of direct sales, which has a major impact in the chain as a whole. You have direct sales for uh, fleet handers that um, is very important, you know, this had a major impact in terms of outbound uh, in freight of uh, finished uh, goods and how you project sales for the future. So, uh, obviously, we're talking about the economic cycles of the auto industry, in, which, which are here in Brazil obviously move a lot with the economy. But for Alpargata as a global company, well, it's global in terms of its sales model, I, I imagine. To what in impact have you felt that crisis, and has it changed anything about, about uh, the supply chain, about how you manage the supply chain for Alpargata? Yeah. Well, the crisis for Alpargata's it's a bit different the craze of the crisis you face in the automotive industry because it's a global company. We, while Brazil was saying that we were in, uh, facing a crisis, we were doing fine in 2013, 14, 15. When we started talking about the recovery, that's when we felt the effects, especially in the domestic market. But in the other years, the domestic market was OK. And because it's a global company in terms of revenues, although we have a smaller part, but at the bottom line, it's very important because uh, it helped us a lot to go through the crisis uh, less affected. So there was a small mismatch. And today, we're still recovering. We haven't yet gone back to the level of 2015. Uh, to touch upon your, your presentation, um, where, where you, you showed the, the um, advanced analytic and error, error reporting there. I think it's interesting, you're head of supply chain and IT. And so I imagine that this, this can you give us any insight into the kind of IT systems that you've introduced to, to improve this forecasting and methods? I mean, is it some cloud-based systems or you know, new and different in comparison to what had been before? Perfect. Well, supply chain, IT, there's no right or wrong answers here. There are many companies that have a standalone area in IT or not. And that's within finance or supply chain. The different companies work differently. Why is our IT in supply chain? First, we have a horizontal view. We are the company that talks more from the supplier and until the consumer end in China. So we are heavy IT users. So we have a strong need there. Also, in order to develop this project of machine learning, we actually had to invest in new systems, lighter, simpler systems, with a very heavy integration with our legacy systems and the new systems. The new systems are cloud-based. So we still have a ERP that's strong, on-premise, heavy, industrial. But slowly, we are moving to our retail ERP. Anything that's commercial sales is going to the cloud with global platforms. And in supply chain, order management is still in on-premise, and now we're moving it to cloud. to more quickly adapt to our global ch chain. These are, those are topics that are very similar in the automotive and how that migration is happening. Any questions from, from the audience? Well, again, um, uh, our, our speakers will be around to speak during the coffee and separately. But if you have any, any, uh, any questions you'd like to put to them now, please don't. We probably have time for, for, you know, for maybe one, one or two more before we, we give you a coffee break. Um, Okay, we've got we're on the cusp of a new uh, new government in in Brazil. 
Um, perhaps starting again with you, Gustavo, not least because Anfabia speaks for, on behalf of OEMs. What, what, you know, what are some of the messages you would send? What, what are you hoping to see that the change that would improve your business from the point of view of the supply chain, logistics, and broadly in the automotive sector? Well, I think there is a great expectation uh, with the new administration and more and more, we want regulations to be clear long term so that we can have more pre predictability because that benefits the market as a whole for manufacturers, the government, consumers. But I would like to go along the lines of CGPS's talk, speaking about the industry as a whole that involves logistics and production and sustainability as a whole investments in alternative fuels, connectivity, electrification. Another important point is the fleet renewal and the vehicle technical inspection, which is directly related to logistics. When I used to work with logistics directly, even a large operations with a large operator, it is very difficult to operate in the market because of the old fleet and the cost that it generates due to emissions and maintenance. So we're talking about this new regulation, Euro 6, and we have Euro 0 driving in Brazil. So if this is implemented, it will become a virtual cycle because this will generate more production, more savings, differently from what some people may think, and would help to boost the flow as a whole. So we expect regulations that are more predictable to finish the other paperwork, for example, multimodal segment. There is an infrastructure issue, but there's also a bureaucratic part of allowing ships not to have a mandatorily a Brazilian flag, for example, to increase fl productivity or competitiveness. So this is what we expect from the new government. Perspective of okay. Okay. passes. Well, I would say, to emphasize what Gustavo has said, what we do need is a major effort to recover infrastructure in Brazil. We talked about the fleet, logistics, but the situation of the roads and infrastructure as a whole is very complex for everyone. I mean, it uh, has suffered a lot and it's specifically shown in the cost of Brazil. And we do expect this new go government to do what has not been done in the lately, which is causing investments to correct these failures that we have in infrastructure. This is an important message. And that also includes the implementation of a vehicle inspection that would be closely related to the maintenance state of uh, vehicles that are running, and also a fleet renewal that's done in a rational manner so that we would have uh, vehicles at their full potential running around Brazil. And this has a cost, uh, but it must be done. And it will be a responsibility of uh, this new government to take action regarding that. If we were to list everything that it must be done, we won't have dinner. I mean, but adding to what our friends here said, uh, the tax reform is urgent because the tax complexity in Brazil is enormous. Companies spend a lot of time just to try to ascertain how much should be paid. And those, so this is something that should be done quickly. And investing in education, investing more 
in education, university, research, and basic um, or fundamental uh, school in the early years, uh, to, and also technology. There is a lack of uh, education, of uh, professionals that are required for this new era. We've talked about uh, several changes, connectivity, electrification, aut autonomous vehicles, and the technology that requires is uh, enormous. And uh, we have to train all these people, the, la few, the labor that we work in the future, so that we get more integrated with the world. And of you, but in terms of... Uh of, of any regulatory barriers or hurdles that also impact on, on the supply chain from Afragatus? Well, it's, it's a very different industry, but maybe I would take this opportunity to say that if this new government, I agree with him, I think technology is key. Brazil loses competitiveness due to the lack of industrial policy, but also due to the lack of education. I think that the political reform is also very important. Our political system must be reformed, and this is one of the priorities to untie some of the knots that will help to create uh, growth areas for, the, for lifestyle and uh, logistics industries as a whole. Because, uh, well, we don't want to deprive you of coffee, let alone dinner. So, um, uh, but, but before, I mean, I think that last point uh, that both, uh, well, the panel made some great points about the change, but I think the technology and the education and training focus is really important. And that's indeed one of the pillars of, of this event that we're looking at. And we'll have more discussion around that later in the day. Um, but certainly in terms of making sure that we have the skills uh, and education to, to manage the supply chains of the future is going to be critical here in Brazil and South America. With that, I want to thank our panelists once again for a great discussion and topics. <laughs> Sorry to have kept you a little bit longer, but we'll, have, we'll take a full half hour for the coffee break now, and we'll start back in again here at quarter past 11. Thank you very much.